Hi guys, um, my name is Nathan Naidu. Um, I'm from Snode. For those of you who don't know who Snode is, uh, Snode's uh, SA built homegrown technology. We're deployed across six continents and we defend about 8 million devices. If you don't know who I am, um, South African born and bred, a uh, big protagonist for South African innovation, um, and I'm lucky enough to, to have two South African Innovation Awards uh, with a few others, right? So, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, so, um, you know, my mom never, uh, always used to tell me you'll never learn anything from watching TV. Uh, absolutely not true. So I was watching Mr. Robot, and there's this episode where Elliot is essentially in this alternate universe, and he's the CEO of AllSafe, right? And he's speaking to, uh, I think this guy's name's Terrell, but he's the dude with the really, really hot wife who, like, you know, and um, hard to forget that, actually. But um, what he says is, basically, I've seen you get hacked, right? He said, I've seen the worst that can happen, and I know how to stop it. And the guy's like, what do you mean? Did I get hacked? And he's like, no, 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 no. I ran some simulations. So the first thing I go through my head is, like, how cool would that be? But not like running a simulation like a desktop exercise, right? Imagine if we could run hundreds or thousands of simulations every second, right? So as soon as vulnerability landscape changes or the threat landscape changes or your asset landscape changes, immediately it runs a simulation, almost like detection as simulation, right? Here's the problem, right? Now it's 3 o'clock in the morning, it's about a, a year ago. I'm looking at the client data and I'm, and I'm thinking about this episode of Mr. Robot, and I'm looking at the client data, and I see 78 vulnerabilities. You know, I look at the threat data, and I see 78 sort of threats actively. It's just information, right? I mean, I love the platform. We built it. It's great. Lots of people love it and, and use it, but it's not intelligence. Not quite, right? I mean, you've got 78 vulnerabilities. So what? Now what? A lot of you are sitting with thousands of vulnerabilities, right? Where do you go from there? What's the very first thing you need? Are they all really high risk, right? So the kind of idea is on simulation is, sure, I could do a physical simulation, like a pen test, right? Problem is it's vulnerability-centric, it's expensive, things can go wrong, things can go down, and, um, uh, but it's very high fidelity, right? The other thing is point in time. I can do emulation, you know, go into a lab, blow up some malware, see what happens. Great, really expensive exercise, time consuming. Or I can do this desktop simulation, right? Where I get somebody like from some Resh's team, they come down, they sit. Problem with the desktop simulation is a few things. It's the lowest fidelity of the three. Also, risk is kind of in the eye of the beholder, right? So you get like the legal guy, he's gonna come tell you a different story. Um, you know, you get a pen tester, he's gonna come tell you a different story. You get me and Jason, and, and Jordan, and we'll tell you, look, your biggest threat is actually criminal syndicates paying people internally to get into your database, right? So risk is in the eye of the beholder. So here's a research question that we come up with, right? Is how do I essentially change this into a data-driven exercise? How do I increase the fidelity on that kind of modeling exercise? And how do I run thousands of these modeling exercises per second, in real time, on real time data, internal to the organization, and outside. Right, so the first thing is, let's take the vulnerability information, right? The vulnerability information by itself, it lacks context, right? Vulnerability on what asset, right? Agreed? Not all assets are created equal. Then that will give me the impact. If I take the threat intelligence that comes with that, well, that gives me the likelihood, right? So what vulnerability data is missing is it's missing the other two components, right? So is there a way that we can marry these components? Right, so if you're going to automate anything, well, just like this is in my experience, you've got to be able to do it properly manually first, right? Then once you've perfected it manually, is then go ahead and automate it. So I'm a big fan of taking the manual process that you've been using for years, like, for example, threat hunting, and then trying to automate that, right? So 
design the threat procedure of like all the active threats. Let's take human operated ransomware groups, um, Blackbuster, Lockbit, etc. Mapping their kill chains, etc. Looking at what vulnerabilities they're using, then map those vulnerabilities to my environment, right? And then start drawing successful attack paths, right? And um, like any pen tester, where will I draw my successful attack path? To Active Directory, right? Which is not always, in truth, the, mass, the biggest risk in the business. I'll come back to that. And then prioritizing the risks on the most critical assets. And then regenerating that process a thousand times, maybe even more than a thousand times, per second. Right? Makes sense. Everybody's following me. So when you change this into a, to a, a machined exercise, right? You're looking at a couple of modules. Number one is correlation, right? Because you've got to correlate the threat intelligence to the vulnerability data to the asset, right? But now, a lot of you guys would know the asset landscape changes so fast, you know, with Internet of Things, your shoes is connecting to the network, your Watch is connecting to the network. Pretty hard for us to explicitly go and define every asset, right? So you need a classification module, something like Bayesian classification, right? Which is looking at the data and automatically classifying, oh, this is your ERP. Oh, this is Postillion. This is an ATM. This is SCADA. This is a historian, right? And telling you and understanding the context of that asset and the criticality to your business. Then being able to go through news articles, white papers, research, all of those things, and saying, hmm, this is a threat actor. They're attacking FortiGate, um, SSL VPNs. Maybe they're using compromised credentials. Maybe there's a, a zero-day vulnerability. And then understanding that context, because sometimes that's just enough context, like compromised credentials. You don't need a vulnerability to be sitting on the VPN, right, for it to come up on your vulnerability scan for that thing to be an issue, right? Maybe you just don't have multi-factor authentication. So let's take a look at it. So this was actually the diagram that came from the first time I ran the thing, right? But I ran it pretty simply. I ran Nmap, I took a port scan, I ran it through the classifier, and then you kind of get the idea, right? Port 53, ah, oh, DNS server, right? Oh, this is SAP, okay, it's an ERP. Oh, and this is the criticality of these systems. Then it goes onto the internet, goes onto you know, collect some RSS feeds and understands, okay, the, these are the issues, et cetera. And then I threw it into a client environment. As a matter of fact, I threw it into the same client environment with those 78 vulnerabilities, 78 active threats, right? Which is kind of interesting. And then I didn't quite understand the results, right? We're talking about explainable AI, right? So I started trying to reverse engineer what actually do these models produce? When you go and you take a look at it, essentially it's saying, hey, listen, you've got a, an asset that's exposed to the internet. This thing is being exploited by a threat actor. And you've got an application. And behind that application, you've got a database. And this is your most critical asset. And I was like, OK, but I know this client, right? I know this environment. Why is this a critical asset? Turns out the database is an airtime database. Application isn't the application that we would think it is. It's USSD gateway. And the only thing it actually got wrong was the VPN part. Because it was a point-to-point -point VPN. It wasn't an actual sort of user VPN, right? But I didn't know any of those things. If you know anything about airtime, right, there can be like 16 million rands worth of airtime sitting in an airtime database. This was, at the time, was one of the largest MVNOs in the country. It was probably more than 60 million sitting there. How did the application know that? That's when we realized, OK, now we're on to something. So I write really, really bubblegum sort of code, come up with really crazy ideas. And then I've got a team of like 49 people. Actually, the man who built the rest of it is sitting right there. I've got a team of 49 people and their job is making my crazy ideas that I get at 3 a.m. come to life, all right? And uh, so these guys go out and they build this thing for me. And actually what I want to do is I want to show you what it looks like today, right? 
keep in mind, right, guys, this is, this is research, right? We don't know what we don't know. Otherwise, it wouldn't be research if we knew the answers to everything. And it's pretty interesting how it looks, right? So this is ultimately asset cartography. It's going to show you a map of the entire client's environment in real time. This includes shadow IT, things we don't know about, all of those kinds of things. And now it's showing you the links of communications that happen between them, right? Now keep in mind, it's not necessarily a vulnerability on a server, right? It can be a browser vulnerability. So these inbound connections, you can see that green dot is a firewall, right? Um, so firewall is talking, the red dots, those are vulnerable assets. We, we find them at about L3. And every L2 is some sort of path between it, right? And when you look there, can you see those red lines? Those are actually the most critical attack parts. And now you answer the question. I've got 78 vulnerabilities. I've got 78 active threats. So what? Now what? When I leave this conversation, what is the first thing I need to fix? And you know exactly what's the first thing you need to fix. If we go back to that presentation very quickly. And I show you this. Asset 1, A1, V1, they're on the left-hand side. That is actually the problem. You fix that, and it breaks the chain. So if you're wondering, oh, well, OK, but I saw like six red lines. No, six red lines may be attributed to one problem. You fix one problem, you solve various other problems, right? So the, your ability to prioritize your data um, and understand risk that's highly likely and high impact now can be done pretty much through AI. So this platform, I want to leave a few minutes for questions. I've got three minutes. This is actually going into beta, into Snow's products, now for our clients. When does it go into beta? Is it? It's already live on two clients. So it's pre pretty much in beta already. Yeah, OK. So it's, it's already live on two clients, and two people are using it. Um, just word of caution, I was speaking to the Telspace guys, I didn't know this, but apparently there's another company somewhere in the world that's doing this exactly the similar sort of concept. So um, I'm not saying necessarily we're the first, but it's pretty fun stuff. Okay, so I'm sure some of you guys may have questions. I just want to field questions. I think we've got two minutes. Maybe I can take two questions. No? Sure. Yeah, no, um, okay, great question. If you want to get your hands on the tech, 100% contacts node, we put a sensor in your environment, eavesdrops on everything, collects the data, and it just produces this result. It's like installed, we say in four hours, but actually it's installed in a couple of minutes. So easy to access tech. No, it's not agent-based. I deliberately didn't want to make Snow agent based because I see a future where, you know, think about industrial IoT, smart edge, all of those kinds of things. You can't put an antivirus, you know, on, a, on an IoT sensor, like you can't put it on a watch or the shoes that we were talking about, right? So Snowd operates in the network space, but it has the ability to, to look at data, even cipher data. I don't know if you guys know this, but we've got a patent for being able to detect attacks in encrypted communications, meaning we don't do deep packet inspection. You do not have to sacrifice your secrets for us to protect you. Um, I'm not saying we're like the first to come up with it. The first to come up with it is Cisco, but you can't buy it from Cisco. We're the only company that I know of that does that. So no, it operates on the network layer, and it doesn't need like SSL certificates. Also, SSL's interception, by the way, I'm sorry, I know this is not the point of the conversation. It, you can't decrypt all the outbound SSL, right? You can just, a couple of servers coming in, it's not really the answer. So you're missing, with so much of our traffic, I think Google's transparency report will tell you like 98% of the traffic is encrypted. 
really, signature-based detection, threat detection, it's not the answer, guys. And you're missing about 70% of the picture because you're either relying on SSL interception and you can't get the, the private keys for, like, you, you can't decrypt a lot of your encrypted traffic. So I don't think SSL interception is the answer either. Signature-based detection, though still there's a place for it. SSL interception, there's a place for it, but it's definitely not the answer going forward. Okay, I'm out of time. Any more questions? I'll take one last question if there is one. Yeah, gentleman in the back. Uh, you said that your yeah. uh, that Snowd can detect payloads and um, Correct. malicious uh, Correct. packets Correct. through it's a global patent, patent so, pending in the U.S. But then, at the same time, files. you said that you don't have to sacrifice your privacy. So, it, can it see the payload through the encryption, or yeah. how does that? How does, so then, how do you not sacrifice your privacy? Uh, it doesn't do signature-based detection to understand the payload. It looks at the metadata, not the actual packet data. Right, the metadata around the packet, that's where Snowd comes into play. We look at the metadata around the packet, not the data inside the packet. So, do you want... Okay, thank you. Okay. And, um, um, and, and I mean, that's kind of the, the beauty. That's why Snowd's across six continents. Also, just out of interest, I know we, we're out of time. If, I, I don't mind if anybody wants to go out to the break, they can. For 40 years, are you the next speaker? I'm done. Sorry, guys, I didn't know. I thought it was a break. Thank you.